name is Clancy's and welcome to the Iron Bars, my true crime YouTube channel. So first things first guys, please do forgive me for my face looking like this because my barber hasn't returned from the holidays yet. Apparently he's returning at the end of January. So you would have to bear with me until he returns and then I will start looking professional once again. But right now, please do tolerate me. Secondly, guys, I would like to please ask of you a favor. Whenever I, whenever I upload a video, please give the video a like because it helps my channel to reach more people. Basically, your like, it triggers the algorithm to push my videos to more people so that the more people that watches my videos then will come and subscribe to my channel and therefore my channel gets a chance to grow. I know that I'm supposed to be making this call of action every single video, but for some reason, I don't. It is advisable that I beg of you to click the like button and also share the video as far as wide as you can so that more people can come across my videos. Now, having said that, let's get into today's case, and it is the case of Sipo Manja Twala, also known as the Phoenix Strangler. So Sipo Twala was born on the 10th of March 1968, making him a Pisces. He was born in a KwaZulu Natal township of Guamashu, which is outside of the coastal city of Durban, also known as South Africa's playground. That's my hometown. So Sipotola was the eldest of two children to a woman by the name of Katazilen Danzi. Sipotola's mother describes him as a very intelligent child who could read and write despite having dropped out of school in grade one. She further said that her son was normal, kind, and always made sure that there was food on the table every single evening whenever he gets paid. So beyond this, I could not get any information or background about Sipo Twala. It ends right there. However, we shall soldier on because there is a lot that we need to cover in this video. So unfortunately for Sipo Twala, we can safely say that he is illiterate. However, he spoke three languages. He spoke English, Afrikaans, as well as Isizulu. This also means that Sipo Twala, when he was a teenager, he had to go and find work. And because he spoke Afrikaans and in South Africa, most farmers are Afrikaners, chances are his treatment in the labor market was much better simply because he was able to speak Afrikaans. He probably had some managerial positions. So when you are in the province of KwaZulu-Natal, if you are going to take a trip west, you are going to see a sea of sugarcane fields. Same goes when you are going to take a trip north of KwaZulu-Natal, you're also going to see oceans upon oceans of sugarcane fields. If you are in the city of Durban, sometime in the year, you will smell the process of sugarcane turned into sugar. If you know how brown sugar smells like, that is how the city of Durban will smell like. It will be as sweet as brown sugar. And I used to enjoy the smell for some weird reasons. And I used to love being in Durban around the October, November period because I think that is the time where you will get that smell. It was coming from the sugar factory called Hewlett, which was based just on the outskirts of the city of Durban near the Durban Harbor. So Sipo Twala was one of the sugarcane farm workers that worked not too far from where he stayed. This particular sugarcane field was on the outskirts of a suburb called Phoenix, Mount, Mount Edgecombe, as well as Guamashu and Besting. So the sugarcane plantation used to be somewhere in between these suburbs. So in 1994, Sipo Twala was accused and arrested by an unidentified woman who said that he had raped her. Unfortunately, in the early 90s, DNA analysis was still making its way to South Africa. By 1994, the DNA analysis was still in its infancy, so police were encouraged that whenever they collected evidence, they needed to collect DNA evidence as well. That was going to be stored in the police evidence room so that when the DNA analysis developed or established well enough, they can use the blood samples that they have stored to match the DNA of an accused if they had been let out. And if the DNA matches, that is when they are going to fetch the accused and then prosecuted. However, in Sipo Twala's case, he was found not guilty and as a result, he was acquitted for the rape accusation of this unidentified woman. 
Unfortunately for the state, Sipotwala could not be brought back to the court and be prosecuted if the DNA did match the one that was collected from this unidentified woman because it would have been a violation of double jeopardy. So basically, double jeopardy, it is when an accused is brought before a court, prosecuted, then the court acquits the accused, therefore meaning that the accused cannot be brought back and be prosecuted for the same crime that they had been prosecuted previously and they were not found guilty for. So the police had to let this one go. However, this DNA evidence would come in handy at a later stage. Now, because South Africa has just entered democracy and segregation laws were disbanded or abolished, therefore, people could move absolutely anywhere and everywhere they wanted to. That also included seeking jobs in the cities and towns as well as in the suburbs of their choice. Unfortunately, that also opened the door for serial killers to take advantage of the fact that many people, particularly women, leaving their homesteads as well as townships and rural areas to go and look for work in big cities like Johannesburg, Durban, Cape Town, PE, and so on and so forth. Some black people decided to further their studies by enrolling themselves into universities that they could not enroll at during the apartheid era, simply because they understood that the future of South Africa was going to be a future of skilled laborers, and so they did not want to be left out in the cold when that started to happen. So on the 5th of March, 1996, a woman by the name of Tandi Majola, who is a dressmaker in an informal settlement of Bambayo, which is outside of the township of Guamashu. She was walking along the North Coast Road when she met a man who struck a conversation with her. In the conversation, the man asked Tandi if she was looking for a job. Tandi said, yes, I am looking for a job because my dressmaking business is not bringing me money at the moment. That is when the man offered Tandi a job at a hotel that he works at. And the hotel's name was the Four Seasons in Durban, which is situated at the Durban beachfront. Tandi wanted to know more information about this job. That is when Sipo told her that the hotel is looking for new cleaners. And they had given him the responsibility to find people that may want a job at the Four Seasons Hotel. When the woman heard this, she thought, fine, that is exactly what I am looking for. It doesn't matter what kind of a job, as long as I'll be able to earn some money and take care of my children as well as my other extended family. So because it was still in the morning time, that is when Sipo said, then we need to go there right now, get yourself registered and start working from today. The woman thought, okay, then let's go. So as they were going, Sipo Twala told the woman that they would have to go through a sugarcane field in order for them to take a shortcut to Durban, to the city of Durban, straight to work. The woman had absolutely no problem. Plus, she did not have money for taxi for herself as well as the men to the city of Durban. So as they were walking through the sugarcane field and they got far enough, that is when Sipotwala took a stone and struck Tandi at the back of her head. She fell to the ground and going in and out of consciousness. When she came to realizing what was happening to her, she tried to fight. She managed to push him and overpower him. And when she did that, she managed to escape with her life. 11 months later, around February 1997, sugarcane farm workers were busy working in the sugarcane field when they came across a very gruesome discovery. Her hands and feet were tied behind her with what looked like pieces of her undergarment. She also had a ball of cloth that was shoved in her mouth, probably to muffle her not to make any sound while she was getting killed. Unfortunately, this body was burned beyond recognition. The reason why her body was burned, remember in my previous case, I spoke about sugarcane at some point they are set alight. I did find out the reason why the sugarcane field are set alight. Apparently, the reason why sugarcane fields are set alight is to chase away venomous snakes, rats, and other creatures that may be living in the sugarcane field. And the sole purpose of that is to ensure that the workers are not harmed in any way by the creatures that may be living in the sugarcane field. The sugarcane farm workers wasted no time and called the police, who came there within minutes and came across this badly decomposing body of a partially naked woman. 
Unfortunately, the body was so badly decomposing as well as burnt, the detectives could not tell the race of the deceased. So the police were able to tell that the body was of a woman because not far from her body, there was a torn petticoat and other undergarments that were also discarded not too far from her body. The police were also discouraged and frustrated at the fact that the body had no evidence for their investigations. On the 14th of April 1997, a 24-year-old Sengi was coming from the shop excited, ran to her house which had her mother and two of her elder sisters and announced to them she has found a job. She was so excited she needed to dress up and go with this man and go to this job that this man had offered her at a hotel. This time it was not the Four Seasons but instead he offered her a job at the Holiday Inn also situated at the Durban beachfront. Now, Shengwe's eldest sister, Rachel, was like, hold on a minute, there is no way that somebody will just approach you from nowhere and offer you a job at a prestigious hotel like the Holiday Inn. So she went outside suspiciously to take a look at this man. And when she got to the gate and looked at him, the man did not look anything like a job recruiter. He looked nothing like a person who worked at a prestigious hotel like the Holiday Inn. She went to him and inquired a few things, almost insulting him and saying, you looking like this, you are a job recruiter for the Holiday Inn. There is no way. He looked so raggedy. He looked almost like a hobo. And so Rachel was like, I am not comfortable with you taking my sister anywhere because how do we know you are not a killer? But the man was able to convince Rachel that indeed there was a job offer for women at the Holiday Inn because the Holiday Inn was looking for new cleaners. Unfortunately for Rachel, because Lengiwo wanted a job, she had a daughter. And she reminded Rachel that if I get a job, I will be able to take care of my child. Reluctantly, she allowed her little sister, Shengi Wimfeka, to go with this suspicious looking man. Now, at Wimfeka household, there was a discussion between the two sisters and their mother. And they were telling the mother that there is no way that that man is a job recruiter. He didn't look anything like a person that has a job to offer for people when he himself looks like he needs a job and so he can earn some money and buy decent clothes. That is when Rachel's mother was like, go after this man and bring back my daughter. Unfortunately, when she ran out, they had disappeared and she had no idea where they had gone. So they had like this unsettling feeling, even though they could not find the sister as well as this man. So they just hoped for the best that indeed this was a job and she was going to return home, having been registered and also has started working for the Holiday Inn. Oh, that was the last time they will see their sister and daughter alive again. Two months after the first discovery, a truck driver stopped by the side of the road and went into the sugarcane plantation. I'm supposing he went to do something when he comes when he came across a gruesome discovery. He came across what looked like a figure of a woman lying dead on the ground. So he decided to take a closer inspection and indeed he could not be wrong. This is a dead woman. That is when he ran back and then he called the police to the scene. Once again, the police wasted no time and there it was, a badly decomposing and burnt body of a woman. She too, her hands and feet were bound behind her and a ball of cloth in her mouth. When the police were at the scene, unfortunately, once again, they will find themselves extremely frustrated because the body was also badly burnt beyond recognition and they could not collect any evidence on the body. In May of 1997, another body was discovered, also badly burned and badly decomposing. At this point in time, the police were starting to notice a pattern. They realized that bodies were piling up in the sugarcane field. Because in the month of June, they would discover four more bodies, also their hands and feet tied behind their back, as well as balls of cloth in their mouth. On the 20th of June 1997, two of the four bodies would be positively identified. One of that body was of Sengiwemfeka. 
It was Sengwe Mfega's mother who had gone to the mortuary to identify her, even though she was badly decomposed. However, her mother could tell that this was her daughter because the previous Sunday, she had braided her hair and she knew the style of braiding she had done on her hair. And that was the exact braiding that this body had on her head. That is how she knew this was her daughter lying on the slab of the mortuary with maggots running all through her body badly decomposed. Now the discovery of Sengwe Mfega's body was was much needed break for the police because the police went to Sengwe Mfega's home to find out exactly what had happened to Sengiwe and that is when the family told the police that a man had offered Sengiwe a job and Sengiwe had brought the man to the house and Rachel and the sister Grace did speak to the man and they were very suspicious of him. He looked nothing like what he had said he was. So the police wanted to know what exactly did he tell Sengiwe and that is when the sister said he offered her a job at the Holiday Inn Hotel at the Durban Beachfront. That is when the police discovered the perpetrator's modus operandi. Just like Toza Miledaki, as well as Moses Sitole, as well as all the other serial killers that I've covered in this channel, they all offered women jobs and then they would pretend to take these women to this so-called job and when they get to a particular point in the in the wilderness and murder these women on the 23rd of june 1997 the body of 12 year old gapsile butelezi was found in the sugarcane field gapsile was found on the same day she went missing now i'm not sure how he managed to lure a 12 year old girl i'm as I suspect that the girl did not live far away from the sugarcane plantation so when he saw her he dragged her into the sugarcane field and that is when he did what he did to her. Kapsila Butelezi would be the youngest victim of this man. So now at this point seven bodies had been discovered in the same sugarcane plantation. That is when the police decided you know what we need to escalate this case to the Durban murder squad. They will take over and investigate and find the perpetrator as soon as possible with their expertise. The Durban murder squad was led by Superintendent Philip Felthazen. Felthazen had special training in the whole world of serial killers. He had to devise a way to catch the serial killer. When Felthazen was handed this case, he contacted South Africa's top profiler, Mickey Pistorius. Felthazen and Mickey Pistorius both agreed that the murders were done by the same man. You know, when I was researching this case, I could not stop thinking about Lengiwe's mother when she had to go and identify the body of her child who did not look anything like her child because all she could see on that slab was bones, maggots, and a smelly body of her child. I just cannot imagine how she must have felt. I cannot imagine how what she's going through to this very day because that stuff can mess with you mentally. So as South Africa's democracy was beginning to mature, Dr. Mickey Pistorius noticed that the rise of serial killers was becoming prevalent and she wanted to get to the bottom of this so that it is curbed once and for all. So by the time the 11th body was discovered, that is when Mickey Pistorius as well as Felthazen decided to go into the archives of the SAPS, which is our South African Police Service, and find and look if the perpetrator may have committed other crimes in the past particularly of rape and they must look for cases that were unsolved maybe did go to court then the court threw it out but the perpetrator never served any prison term so on the 12th of july 1997 the 11th body is discovered so when Feldhazen and mickey pistorius looked at all the victims they realized that the killer was targeting women in their early 20s and early 30s so they started making a profile of the serial killer and then they realized that he too was of the similar age and came from the same race as his victims the other thing that felt hazen and mickey pistorius noticed was the fact that the strangler will kill women within the three kilometer radius of the phoenix sugarcane fields which was between phoenix and mount edgecombe 
that is when this man was then called the phoenix strangler because all the murders took place near the township of phoenix so some of the things that they noticed on the 11th body was the fact that the body had been dumped at least two weeks prior although it has started the process of decomposition however it was not burnt so the police felt some sort of relief they managed to look into the body and try to abstract as much as they could hoping that they would hit something in terms of sperm or something that may come from the perpetrator that way they will be able to identify the perpetrator Miki Pistorius, as she was continuing to profile the possible serial killer, she noticed that few of the things that she noted was that the serial killer is interracially, meaning that he would kill within his own race unless motivated by other factors to kill a different race. She also noted that the serial killer, because he seems to be smart, he knew exactly that if he removed the evidence, from the bodies that he had murdered, the police would find it difficult to find him. Pistorius then noted that the perpetrator is possible that he has formal education up to high school and he will also have an above average intelligence. She also noted that he would be a very charming man to women but extremely dangerous to them and possibly carrying a chip on his shoulder. Eventually, the media caught wind of the serial killer on the loose. However, the police and the media struck a deal where the police asked the media if they could not release any information about the serial killer because if they did, chances of him being alerted, he would stop doing what he is doing and it will make it difficult for the police to find him considering the fact that the bodies that they have found thus far, they have not found any evidence on these bodies. So if the media could give the police some time to find evidence and thereafter they will give them the green light to start publishing the story of the serial killer on the loose. Fortunately, the media did hold back but only for a while because the story was news to them in KwaZulu Natal and also in the public interest if something of this nature was taking place in KwaZulu Natal. So the serial killer was aware that the police were after him. So he continued to kill more women. For some reason, I think he got arrogant and confident. The fact that he was not getting caught and yet the police were on his trail it sort of gave him some kind of boost or some kind of arrogance. I'm not sure because he doesn't stop killing. So after the police were done speaking to Shengwen Fekka's family, that is when the identity of the possible serial killer was made public. That is when the media went on a frenzy reporting about a serial killer on the loose. On the news, people were told to be careful about people approaching them, promising them jobs, because that could possibly get them killed. People were warned to be extremely careful, especially women being approached by men offering them a job. The story, of course, became national news, and it was all over the country, and women across the country were being warned to be careful. So on the 31st of July 1997, the Durban murder squad then decided to scour the sugarcane fields of Phoenix, Mount Edgecombe, as well as other places where they had sugarcane field and look and search if they could find any more bodies. Few hours into their search, they discovered two more bodies of women. Also, their hands and feet tied behind them with a ball of cloth in their mouth. So after the discovery of the two bodies, the police and the cadaver dogs went back home, but they returned the following day to continue where they left off. Not long after the resuming their search, the cadaver dogs managed to sniff five decomposing bodies of women. Them too, their hands and feet were tied behind them with, a ball, with balls of cloth in their mouths. All the seven women, their bodies were discovered meters apart, roughly around 15 meters apart. Is it possible that Tozamile Taki was a copycat? 
because his mother's operandi is the same as that of Sipotwala and then he also scattered bodies about 15 meters apart in the same sugarcane field. So of the seven bodies that were discovered in the sugarcane field by the cadaver dogs as well as the search team, four of the bodies, they were positively identified and these were their names. 21-year-old Pumzile Gumede, Ndombeni Ngobo, 29-year-old Noctula Tsele, and 30-year-old Banotile Dube. So Pistorius as well as Felthazen as they were working with the police in the sugarcane field, they noticed that the killer was becoming lazy and careless. Clearly, he was so confident and arrogant because he was not getting caught, he started becoming very sloppy. Which was a good thing for the police because I'm not sure if at this point in time he was trying to get the police to catch him. He wants to stop killing. I don't know because apparently some serial killers, they will start leaving evidence behind so that they can stop killing by getting arrested or killed or whatever the circumstance might be. So is it possible that this man wanted to get caught? That is why he was starting to become sloppy and making mistakes. So one of the seven bodies, the police had found a cigarette bud next to the body. They collected that as part of the evidence and wrapped it up and, and took it to the lab. So at this point in time, we now have 18 bodies that the police have discovered thus far. So after the discovery of these 18 bodies, that is when the police decided to do a stakeout at the sugarcane field, hoping to catch the serial killer red-handed. The serial killer was aware because the story was all over the news and he, do, and he did happen to hear that there is a serial killer on the loose. Do you think he stopped killing? Nope, he didn't. So while the SWAT team as well as the police murder squad were staking out the sugarcane field, the 19th body was discovered. It was of a 20-something-year-old woman who had been killed at least about two days ago. It would be the discovery of the 19th body that brings an end to the killing spree. So while the police were working the crime scene, underneath the 19th body, they discovered two used condoms. Both the condoms had sperm in them. So the police were so excited about this, they packaged that and sent it straight to the lab for DNA analysis, same as the cigarette butt that they had sent to the laboratory. Within 48 hours, Forensics were able to abstract DNA samples from the semen in those condoms. And by 1997, DNA analysis had already matured enough to catch its first rapist and serial killer. The DNA profile matched the one of the cigarette bud, and that is how the police knew that they were dealing with one and the same person that had killed all these 19 women. Again, Mickey Pistorius told the police that it is possible that the serial killer had committed crimes in the past. Once again, they need to go and dig into the and dig into the police archives and find a perpetrator that was caught but the case did not go any further. Once again, the South African police service went back to the archives and started digging for unsolved cases in their possession. So what they were looking for was a case of a perpetrator that was accused of attacking and raping women. So after a few days of searching, they came across a case that had happened in 1994 of a man by the name of Sipo Agmatir Twala who, had, who was accused of rape. Unfortunately, there was not enough evidence to continue prosecuting him and secure a conviction, and therefore, the court had let him go. In the archives, they also came across the blood samples that the police had collected as far back as 1994. So the blood sample was sent to the lab where they had sent the two used condom and the cigarette bud. And what do you know? The blood matched the DNA profiles of the cigarette bud as well as the two used condoms. And the identity of the DNA belonged to a 29-year-old Sipo Akhmatir Twala. So now the police were being informed that they were going to do a dawn raid on Sipo Akhmatir Twala's house 
investing. Now, besting is an informal settlement that is not far from Phoenix. It is basically overlooking the sugarcane field where the killer was dumping bodies. So on the 14th of August 1997, the police squad as well as the murder squad, Mickey Pistorius as well as Philip Felthazen all descended at dawn between 2 and 3 a.m. to Sipo Akhmatir Twala's house where they knocked on his door. He woke up and latched the door and then when and when he opened the door, he was told that he's under arrest. The team of police had come with a Zulu interpreter who was interpreting his rights as they were being read to him. Sipo did not resist. He did not put up a fight. All he did was, was to cooperate with the police. So before the police took him away, they decided to do a search in his house. Inside the house, they found a wealth of evidence. All over his house were underwears of women, like tons of them. Their underwears, their watches, as well as other undergarments that they found in his shack. That is when the police started wondering, this man, did he only kill 19 or more people? At this point in time, it looked like he had killed more than 19 women. Unfortunately, he did not mention where their bodies were. Also in the shack, about eight of his victims' clothing were found in his shack. So when Sipotwala was taken to the Durban Central Police Station for interrogation, they decided that Mickey Pistorius should be the one that interviews Sipotwala. Sipotwala was very surprised to see a woman interviewing him. So Mickey Pistorius had a strategy on how he was going to get Sipo to talk and basically confess to the crimes that he has been committing. Sipotwala wasted no time and told Mickey Pistorius the truth. He admitted that indeed he is the one that has killed all those 19 women. So Mickey Pistorius wanted to know the reason or reasons as to why he was killing young women. That is when Sipotwala told Mickey Pistorius that he hated women. He hated women with a passion. Mickey Pistorius wanted to know why. He said because his girlfriend had committed abortion without consulting him first. So as a result, he hated women. Sipotwala further said that every time he looks at a black young woman, all that, he's, all that comes over him is nothing but anger and hatred. He further tells Pistorius that his girlfriend had no right to abort his baby without his knowledge. He told Pistorius that he killed those women as revenge on his girlfriend through killing these women. Upon hearing of this serial killer and the murders, Sipo Twala's mother and sister were shocked. They could not believe what they were hearing, that their own child and brother is the one that the news has been talking about all this time. They could not believe how he did not show any signs that he was the serial killer. As a matter of fact, whenever the story came on the news, Sipo Twala himself would tell his mother and sister how much he hoped that the police caught this mad, this madman. His family felt that Sipo Twala was a gentleman, loving, supportive, and he loved people. So they didn't understand how in the world did he become a hateful person towards black women. So Sipo Akhmatir Twala was then taken to the Durban High Court to begin his trial. Amongst the witnesses was Tandi Majola. Remember his first victim, Tandi Majola, the dressmaker that escaped with her life? She was the state star witness. She took to the stand and told the court that Sipo Twala had approached her while she was walking the North Coast Road and offered her a job at the Four Seasons Hotel at the Durban Beachfront. Because her business of dressmaking was not bringing her enough money, she thought that if she earned extra money by working, she was going to take, she was going to accept the job from the man. So when they got into the sugarcane as they were taking a shortcut 
to Durban, that is when the man she points at Sipotwala started attacking her. He hit her at the back of her head with a rock. She fell to the ground and immediately went unconscious. And when she came to, the man was busy tying her hand behind her, head, behind her as well as her feet. And that is when she fought him off. And as he was trying to strangle her, that is when she started telling him and promising him that she was not going to tell on him. Please let me go. But he would not stop. So she managed to overpower him and ran away. Tandi Majola also said to the court that he did rape her. So it's clear that all the other women that he has murdered, he first raped them either post-mortem or when he had already tied them. I'm not sure, but it looks like he would uh, hit them on the head while they're unconscious. He would tie the hands and feet behind them and then he would rape them or he would strangle then rape them post-mortem. So on the 31st of March 1999, Judge Vivian Dana finds Sipo Akmatir Twala guilty of 27 counts of murder that were leveled against him. He was also found guilty of 13 counts of rape. Of course, all the women in Durban, KwaZulu Natal, as well as the rest of the country sighed a breath of relief. So the state sought for life without the possibility of parole. However, the court found Sipo Twala guilty of only 16 counts of murder and 13 counts of rape. So he was going to serve 30 years for each murder. He was also sentenced to 12 years per rape, two years for seven counts of indecent assault, and 12 years for an attempted murder of Tandi Majola. So all in all, Sipo Twala was sentenced to 506 years in prison. Sipo Twala will never see the light of day as long as he is still alive in prison. Twala was sent to start serving his 506 years in prison at the Pretoria CIMAX prison. So after Sipo Twala was sentenced, that is when his mother and sister told the media that they are relieved that he is now behind bars and he got what was coming to him. So when he was sentenced to 506 years, this is what Sipo Twala's sister said. We are relieved that he has been sent to jail. Who knows? He may have turned against us one day. So this means that even the mother and sister did not trust him because he mentioned how much he hated black women. Well, that is it, guys, with the case of Sipo Twala, also known as the Phoenix Strangler. Once again, guys, I beg you to please like the video. If you are not subscribed to my YouTube channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button and don't forget to click the bell notification so that you do not miss out on of any of my true crime videos. And please leave me a comment down below and let me know what you think of this case. And share this video far and wide. And I will see you next time with a new true crime video. Goodbye.